So, apparently this $10 accessory can lower your CPU temperatures when you're running the likes of 3900K. There is actually two, something for AM5 socket as well. Let's talk about it, let's see how it works and if it works. But one thing for sure works, the sponsored segment. Looking for a cheap way to license your windows? Check out WhoKeys through the links in the video description. Make sure to use the code TN20 to get a 30% off. Paste the license to the activation settings and you're all done. This license is for Windows 10, but you can upgrade it to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Microsoft Office 19 license. Use the same code TN20 to get a 30% off. Check out WhoKeys.com in the video description below. So first of all, I'm going to do some testing beforehand. All right, so what we have set up over here is a little bit of a test bench. It's the same test bench setup that we do our air cooling testing, what we did over there, but also the same one that we use for the CPU testing for, you know, 13th gen, 12th gen, just the GPU is missing. I haven't got the GPU on, everything else is the same. The cooler that I have over here is the Fantex Glacier 1 360 millimeter cooler, but we have three Fantex T30 fans. So we're basically putting as much air through this as possible. I've also got a temperature meter. There's 24.3 degrees in the room right here. I've done about five runs of Cinebench R23 again. So we're not running completely cold over here. And the way this, this is set up is that the fans will blow through the radiator onto the VRMs and the cooler. So the VRMs are like warm, they're not cold. And let's do a single test. Let's see what happens. As you can see, boom, we're thermal throttling pretty instantly. Uh, we're doing 5.4 roughly around all of the P cores, so not 5.5, we're not able to um, keep that for some reason. We're pushing about 320 watts or something like that from the socket, 40,040. Let's do it one more time, let's see what happens. Core temperatures currently about 85 average, P cores are quite high, 40,000. So before we do the test to actually take the reading, just to show you the turbo boost and turbo power max is all unlimited. So there's PL1 and PL2 limits are unlimited. Turbo boost time window is 128 seconds. So there we go. We're just gonna X that one. So we're gonna do go and zero. We are thermal throttling. As you can see, two cores are thermal throttling. We have hit the TJ max there. The thermal throttling is really on the Pico 7 and 5. Maximum we pulled was 328 watts. But now, what we're going to be doing is a 10 minute throttle test. So, we've kind of worked in the cooler, I'd say. Let's go 10 minutes and see how do we do. While this is whizzing in the background, let's see what this is and how does this work then. So basically this is a contact frame for your 12th and 13th gen CPUs. And if you didn't know how this works, is basically this is a very, very simple thing. You're gonna replace the actual contact frame or the um, closing mechanism that comes with every single one of the Intel motherboards and you replace it with something like that. This is your CPU will essentially go in there and this bracket will hold it down rather than two metal clips I'll show you when we're gonna do the change in a moment, but it's a very simple thing like that. And you might be saying, which one of these contact frames should you be using? Because there is something from Thermal Chrysler, but also that costs about $40 or something like that. About four times as much as this one, but if this does exactly the same thing, is if this is manufactured exactly the same kind of preciseness, and holds the CPU down exactly the same way. Why go with the more expensive one when you can go with this one? And the reason why you would go with this one is because there is something called like the CPU bending over time. There is the IHS of the CPU. There are instances where the bracket or the motherboard, the way it holds the CPU down can actually bend the CPU IHS very, very slightly. So if we are looking at the likes of this one here, which is a, uh, 12500 right then this in here can actually slightly bend over here the ihs can go a little bit like that because we're holding it down on this side and that side these are the only contact frames on the side and because this is kind of rectangular there you might just bend it well that's what might happen if you put a lot of heat in there and that's especially true or seen with the higher end cpus 
the likes of i7s and i9s that pull over 200 watts, which means when it gets hotter, what usually happens with the metal is when it gets hotter, it usually gets a bit softer, which means that if you've got pressure on it, it can bend a little bit. And we're not talking about bending that you can see with your eyes, a bending that can just be slightly there, like micrometers that slightly bends it out. And then that means that your cooler is not gonna make a perfect contact on it. So it might bend it slightly down from the middle, which means that your CPU will be something like that. And if you put it down, the middle part of your CPU, as you can see here, might not make that perfect of a contact. So we're gonna see if this is actually gonna make a difference there. We're gonna read the measurements for 10 minutes. Then we're gonna change it out to this contact frame and then see if that's gonna make any difference at all. This contact frame, what I'm using over here, is from Thermalright, and this literally costs about $10. If you're buying an like i7 or i9, you should definitely use it. I'm using this in my personal rig, but I just wanted to do a test here as well. Now, this one actually comes with thermal paste as well from Thermalright and a little Torx Allen key. There is the same thing for AM5, as you can see here. Same thermal paste and Torx and then screws interestingly here and then the am5 bracket this one's heavier than the intel one but how this will work is pretty much exactly the same way that if you've got the cpu there like that then this bracket will just go over it and it will hold it down just like that so if we slot the cpu in there there we go and the ihs is slightly higher than the contact frame as you can see from there but I don't think this is as big of a deal or as big of a problem from the Ryzen because Ryzen is not so rectangular, which means that the kind of force is more evenly spread around the IHS compared to the 12th or 13th gen. Still get some benefits when going with AMD Ryzen. You'd still get much more even or equal pressure around the IHS because as you can see, the pressure comes from all of these points around the IHS compared to just on the sides. And if you're using thermal paste, it actually helps you clean the CPU a bit much, much easier if you're doing changes of the cooler or something like that, because the thermal paste doesn't go all over the socket, is less likely to go on the socket. And the other benefit is actually getting the thermal paste coverage on the CPU here. You can see that this covers the IHS pretty much evenly. And if you put thermal paste over, it's not going to get on the socket or on the motherboard there. So that's a little bit better. I have got already thermal paste there a little bit, so I'm gonna have to do some cleanup. So this is the 10 minute run now done. First of all, we can see the score 38,347, which we didn't actually reach the 40,000 mark during this run um, because it didn't manage to keep the clock speeds as high. So there's a few parameters that we can look at when doing this test. First of all, the final score because over the 29 tests that it ran through if the cpu is cooler it can keep the boost clocks higher and higher the higher the boost clocks is the more points we're going to get on the score which means the average will be higher shut this down change the contact frame and then let's try it again so if we're looking at the cpu socket here you can see that there's two points of contact where it holds onto the actual socket and that presses down there and everything else is kind of open. So the CPU is only pressed down like kind of from the middle over there and that's it. You can see when we open this up, it's these two that make contact on that side there. And basically the installation of this goes like that. You're gonna use the Torx key and then you're gonna use these four screws here, one, two, three, four around to pull the already socket out there. And when you start to undo them, you realize that these are very, very loose. You don't need to put any strength in there, but you're going to need those screws, okay? Because you're going to use the same screws. I'm just surprised how loose these are. Now, careful with the contact frame because you might have thermal pastes all around it as well. Leave the CPU socketed in there because that's going to actually uh, protect your socket. I'm just going to clean some of the thermal paste off the CPU. And then you're going to take the contact frame and there's a little arrow on that side of the contact frame and that goes on the same side as the CPU arrow. So there's a CPU arrow over there. We're going to twist it around, put it over like that. And now you can see we're going to make contact all around the CPU and we're going to put it down much evenly. Take the screws, pop them back into holes. And what you will have to do is hold on or push the, the back plate back over there because 
Obviously, when you take four screws out, the back plate will move out of place slightly. And then the question is, how tight should you tighten these screws here? I know Thermal Chrisley has got a very clever way how they kind of measure that you do like half a turn or somewhere when you install their contact plate. Thermalrite doesn't say anything about that. There's very simple instructions. So what I have done is just literally tighten them until they're tight. I'm not going to over tighten them to mental uh, tightness, but just as long as the screw doesn't go around anymore, that to me is tight. And then just go around and then make sure that all the screws are roughly the same kind of resistance or tightness. And now what we do is I'm going to clean the CPU with um, alcohol and then we're going to put thermal paste back on. Okay. For thermal paste, I'm using the same thermal paste as on the previous one. This is the Arctic MX6, and I'm gonna use a spatula to spread it around so that I'm getting even coverage all around the CPU. And here is the nice thing. It does spread nicely and it can't go really around the socket and all over the bracket, but this contact frame nicely holds it tight. Now, to my knowledge, I have done exactly the same installation on both of these instances. The thermal paste application is as same as possible. I've spread it around. So I'd expect anyone who would do this would have similar results on either one of them. Now, you could get probably even closer results by using a robot and utilizing this. But coming from someone who's just a crate and wants to know if this works or not i think this is pretty accurate representation of both of them regarding the fan curves and the aio pump they are exactly the same on both of these systems the aio pump is running 100 percent speed all the time and the fan speeds are the basics curve from the bios which means that it's just going to go to 100 percent when it hits 70 degrees so this is just the first try we're going to try to heat it up again a little bit the room is maybe 0.8 degrees warmer one degree warmer let's press start and see if there's any difference thermal throttling pretty instantly got 40,270 points which is very similar for with what we got previously 330 watts something like that from the socket there's two cores that like to run hot the five and seven which is normal let's put 10 minutes on and then let's see what the results are in the end there could be that the cpu is already slightly bent because i've used this for a lot of different benchmarks and you know stress tests and heating it up and so on but we'll see if this is still going to make a difference Okay, we've got uh, 16, 15 seconds to go and looks like we're already on pass 30. So we have done one extra pass than um, we did previously, which is very interesting. Looks like we're getting higher scores than previously. So I'm going to get a screenshot now. Oh, we're doing one extra 31 passes. First of all, 40,000 points is quite a bit higher than before. 38,000 points and 40,000 points before and after. That's very interesting. In terms of the time we measured it, there's extra 14 seconds longer when the contact train for, was on because we managed to complete one extra cycle of the Cinebench run because of that. So here we're looking at average temperatures. On the right, we have before contact frame and on the left, we have after contact frame. First of all, after contact frame, the maximum CPU package was a few watts higher, 330 watts. And the average wattage was higher as well, at 306 watts compared to three, 298 watts. So we were able to pull more power because it helps to keep it a little, a little bit cooler, which is, again, interesting. The CPU package was higher, actually, after the contact frame, which is 102 degrees and 101 degrees before the contract rain. By the way, CPU package power, that temperature reads all the sensors from the CPU. There is loads of them. This is the highest value of any of the sensors. This could have been the iGPU, this could have been the cache, this could have been uh, any of the sensors in there, what the temperature is. It was 102, but it was higher, one degrees, and so was the average a little bit higher there. When we're looking at the temperatures of the CPU, they have been pretty much the same. It's been 83 and 83 
on both of them. The CPU package was a little bit higher on with the contact frame. Minimum was, was about the same here and so was the current 46 to 47 degrees. But now the interesting thing comes here when we are looking at the average clock speeds. When we're looking at the average on P cores, okay, so these are the upper parts here, we're all about 5.41 something, all right? Some of them slightly higher, some of them slightly slower. If we're looking at here, none of them are 5.4. As you can see, all of them are 5.3. So the contact frame even helps with the clock speeds and bear in mind we had one degree advantage without the contact frame because the room was colder and perhaps things weren't heated up as much so the contact frame had this advantage there but it managed to keep higher clock speeds throughout 10 minutes you can see the average of all of them was 4.66 compared to the 4.62 which isn't as much but when you're looking at the peak cause frequencies that's where the big difference is higher 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 okay e core 20 was slightly slower that was higher that was higher that's higher 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 so interesting, even all of the E cores were higher. So what's the conclusion here? Number one, does it help? Yes, looks like it does help, but not as much as you might think. The biggest difference is your actual cooler, which cooler you're using and what's your thermal paid application. And if you have a good contact with that one, I think that will make a bigger difference because if you do have bad thermal paste, worse of a contact with that, you might see worse results, but it will help in the long run. The more you use the CPU, the more it heats up and is under load, the more it gets softer and the more it helps spread the heat down and get your better contact with your CPU. And that's what we see after 10 minutes. If we kept it running for 24 hours, we'll probably see even bigger of a difference. Should you buy it? I think you should buy it if you're running an i7 or higher CPU. Now, it's definitely not necessary and your CPU will be completely fine as a creator because most likely you're not gonna be having it under load until you're rendering or doing some 3D blender cycles or something like that. It is worth considering when you're running an i7 or i9, especially the 13th gen CPUs, because it costs so little. It's only about $10, and when you factor in the whole cost of the system and how easy it was to change and apply, it kind of makes sense to buy it because it's only about $10. And what I like is that it's four times cheaper than the Thermal Grizzly one. And it looks like it does exactly the same job. Bad news for Thermal Grizzly, I guess, but good news for Thermal Right. If you want to check it out, I'm going to leave the link in the description below. By the way, if you do want to build yourself the best bank for Bot Creator PC, then there is a build guide in the description below. I highly recommend you check that out. Pick the one that has the closest budget to you and then just go with that video. You can go upgrades and downgrades and then build yourself the best bank for Bot Creator PC. Don't leave performance on the table. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Adios. <laughs>